Hello everyone, welcome to AS Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in today's video I will be sharing chapter 5 of the AS Biology syllabus with you which is the mitotic cell cycle. If you have just stumbled on this channel, please know that I am sharing the chronological order of the Cambridge AS Biology syllabus so that students are able to revise and also take charge of their learning in order to cement their understanding of things they have learned in class or simply to prepare for their examinations. If there are any questions you would like to ask me, please post them in the comment section and I promise to get back to you as soon as possible. I am using notes from my classroom, so please make sure you are paying attention and if possible, take down notes wherever you deem necessary. So when I teach mitosis, I usually ask students at the beginning of the class, how many chromosomes are there in the human cell? And often students will say, well, there are 23 chromosomes, or some of them would say 46. The correct answer when you are asked that question in that way is that there are 46 chromosomes in the human cell, which means that there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. As you look at this image, which we call a karyogram, that is an image of the chromosomes within the body, you will see that the chromosomes are arranged in pairs, which which we call homologous pairs, but we're not going to go into that detail today. I just want you to know that there are 46 chromosomes in the human cell and we then say that there are 23 pairs. So what are chromosomes made of? When you look at a chromosome, it looks like a big giant X. And if you look at the image that I have put here, the one with the blue and the yellow, you will see that each half of the chromosome is called a chromatid. So we usually say that chromosomes are made up of two sister chromatids and are joined together by a centromere. It is important for you to know as a biology student that the centromeres can occur along the length of the chromosome at any point. So centromeres are not always at the center. You can find them sometimes at the top or sometimes very close to the bottom. Chromosomes are also made up of chromatin. Chromatin are simply tightly coiled forms of DNA or the tightly coiled form of our DNA. And the reason why it is important for our chromosomes to exist as chromatin is because the human DNA is about 1.8 meters in length, while the nucleus where the DNA is stored is only 6 micrometers in length. So in order to effectively keep the DNA in the nucleus, the chromosomes are often in the form of chromatin, whereby they are thread-like structures and are able to wind up in order to fit into the nucleus. We also have telomeres, which are part of chromosomes, and telomeres are simply the end regions of the chromosomes. I'm going to share a fun fact with you on the next slide. So when you look at the image of all of these people, what comes to mind? Some of my students say, oh, well, they're all very popular. They're actors, they're actresses. Well, something that struck me when I was doing some research about aging was that the way people age today is very different from how people aged in the past. So a 40 year old person today tends to look a lot younger than someone who was 40, 20 years ago. And the reason for this is that telomeres have been found to be related to aging. And the idea is that the longer your telomeres are, that means the longer the end regions of your chromosomes, the younger you will look as an individual. Obviously, there are ideas about how lifestyle plays into the length of chromosomes, but I just thought that's a fun fact to share. You can do some more research and please be happy to share them in the comment section if you find anything interesting. Now let's get to the nitty gritty of what we have to discuss, the cell cycle. The cell cycle is simply the cycle the cells go through in order for them to be able to divide. So we have what we call the cell division. If you look at the image on here, we have the cell cycle, which is made up of a G1 phase. We have the S phase, we have the G2 phase, and then we have the cell division phase. The G1 phase simply represents the cell growth. And that is where the cells simply grow in size. We also have the S phase, which is where DNA replication occurs, and you will see why DNA replication is important. Then we have the G2 phase, which is where the cell prepares for mitosis, and then we have the mitotic cell division, where the cell undergoes mitosis for sure. We call the mitotic cell division just cell division, or you can call it nuclear division. And what happens during each phase of the cell cycle is what we are going to look at in the next slide. 
We have the interface phase, which is usually referred to as the resting stage of the cell cycle. And what happens during interphase is that the cell grows to its normal size, carries out its normal functions until it receives a signal to divide again. Then we have the G1 phase, which is the phase after cell division, and that is where the growth happens. We then have a DNA replication phase, which is the S phase. And in this case, the DNA in the nucleus will replicate, which means it would make copies of itself in order to make identical chromosomes and chromatids. We also then have the G2 phase, which is the phase after the S phase, where the cell is preparing to divide through mitosis. The G1 phase, the S phase, and the G2 phase make up the interphase, which is generally referred to as the resting phase of the cell. So to get to the nitty gritty of things, this is mitosis. And usually when students are told to learn mitosis, I think many students become nervous because it's a lot of detail and they're just really scared that they would forget. While it's very easy to remember mitosis, if you're able to pay attention to the images that are used to represent mitosis, the very first thing you need to know is that mitosis occurs in five different stages. You have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and cytokine. Kinesis. Usually, in many cases, cytokinesis is not considered a phase of mitosis, and so in that case, people would say that it requires only four stages, which would be prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. But worry not about that, because most of the questions you get do not necessarily ask you about the number of phases of mitosis, but would rather ask you what is happening at different stages, or ask you to identify from an image which phase of mitosis a cell is at. So with that in mind, I would say that you should try as much as possible to use any means that would help you remember the different phases. I love to use the images because it's easy for me to just look at an image and be able to say, okay, this is anaphase, this is metaphase, or this is prophase. And as you can see from the image I have used on this slide, these are very distinct. So you can tell exactly what is going on where. Something else to also bear in mind is that prophase, which is the first phase of mitosis is often split into two phases of its own. So early prophase is when the chromosomes start to appear. If you remember from the previous slide, I said that the chromosomes or the DNA in the cells are usually in the form of chromatin, which is tightly coiled strands of DNA in order to fit into the nucleus. When early prophase is about to begin or when early prophase starts rather, you see that the chromosomes start to appear as actual chromosomes and the centrosomes also also replicate. If you're unsure of what centrosomes are, please make sure you go back to chapter 1 and read the different functions of organelles in your textbook. You also have late prophase, where the nuclear envelope disappears, the nucleus disappears, and the chromosomes are now seen to consist of two chromatids with the centrosomes moving to opposite poles. Also note the difference here between the centrosomes and the centromeres. The centromeres are the ones that hold the chromatids together to make up the chromosomes, while the centrosomes are not part of the chromosomes at all. As a matter of fact, they exist outside of the chromosomes. So, with that said, with the late prophase, now we have the nuclear envelope gone, we have the nucleolus gone, and we can see our chromosomes very clearly as they are, consisting of two chromatids. We then have metaphase, which is the next phase. And at metaphase, always think of metaphase as the phase whereby the chromosomes align themselves at the center of the cell. We call that part of the cell the equator. And what happens there is that the centrosomes, which were moving to the opposite poles, have now reached the opposite poles and have begun to make what we call the spindle fibers. The spindle fibers will attach to the chromosomes at the centromeres and in anaphase we will see that the spindle fibers will pull the chromosomes apart which means that the sister chromatids will be pulled to separate poles during anaphase as you can see in the third circle on this image. The next phase then would be telophase whereby we have the nuclear envelope reappearing the nucleolus will reappear, the spindle fibers will break down, and the chromatids will uncoil again in order to make chromatin. What this simply means is that at the end of mitosis, we are going to be making two different cells, and that is why you can see two different nuclear envelopes on the face that says 
telophase. And so that is what leads to cytokinesis, whereby the cytoplasm will then divide in order to result in the formation of two daughter cells. And these two daughter cells are identical in every form. They are identical cells and that is the end result of mitosis. If you found that confusing, I will suggest that you please try to watch it again. Now the big question is why is mitosis so important? Well, every time you get an injury, I don't know if you've noticed this, but if you bruise your arm or your knee while running or while doing something around the house and you just scrape your hand against the wall, after a while you start to see that new skin cells will grow over that injury and cover it up and all you will be left with is a scar. Well, the point of mitosis is that mitosis results in growth. It is the way we actually grow as human beings because our our cells divide to produce identical cells and that way we are able to continue growing. Mitosis is also important for the replacement of cells and the repair of tissues just as I have explained with the bruised knee or a bruised arm. In some cases for some organisms, mitosis is important for asexual reproduction. An example of such an organism is amoeba and amoeba simply reproduces itself by budding which means it simply splits into two and that is what we call asexual reproduction. It doesn't make any sexual gametes, it doesn't require any DNA fusion, all it does is simply bud and it breaks into two in order to reproduce itself. Mitosis is also important in immune responses and this will become very important when we discuss chapter 11 where we discuss how the b cells and the t cells are made to respond to infections within the body and this brings me to why telomeres are so important Telomeres prevent the loss of genes during replication and they allow cells to continue to replicate. As you can see here in this diagram, you can have the green sections which are the telomeres and they are simply repetitive nucleotides or basically repetitive DNA molecules. And what they do is that they allow for the DNA polymerase enzyme, which is responsible for DNA replication to bind and to be able to copy the whole DNA of that cell. This might mean nothing to you now, but when we get to DNA replication in chapter 6, that will help you understand better. The nucleotides that are in telomeres don't contain any genetic information, but what they do is that they elongate the DNA so that the important information can be copied. Remember that DNA polymerase is an enzyme itself that has to bind to a section in order to copy DNA. That section would then be the telomeres, so it means that that section is not necessarily copied, but it provides a stance or should I say it provides a point for DNA polymerase to bind so that it can copy the actual DNA that is contained within the chromosomes. Now the last part of this chapter is mitosis in stem cells and cancer. You've probably heard about stem cells. You've heard that stem cells can be used to reverse different conditions. But the question is, what exactly are stem cells? Stem cells are cells that are able to divide an unlimited number of times, and they can differentiate into different types of specialized cells, such as blood cells or muscle cells. So you can culture stem cells, as you can see in this image, in order to make blood cells. You can make muscle cells. You can make cells of the intestines. You can even make liver cells or you can make cardiac and nerve cells. Obviously, some of these are still at experimental stages, but there is a lot of hope in the application of stem cells. The ability of stem cells to provide or to produce different types of cells is referred to as its potency. And you will see that based on potency, there are different types of stem cells. So for example, we have the totipotent stem cells. What this means is that they can produce any type of cell at all. And an example is the zygote that is formed whenever you, we have the fusion of a sperm and an egg during fertilization. We have embryonic stem cells which give rise to different organs and these cells are called pluripotent, but they are also still called totipotent cells simply because they can divide into any type of cell. So remember when you have fusion of an egg with a sperm, 
the egg at that point doesn't have any shape. As a matter of fact, if a woman were to go for a scan at a very young pregnancy age, so let's say she's only about four weeks pregnant, she would only be able to see a tiny speck, which looks like a round little dot or an oblong dot, depending on what it looks like. And the point of that is just to say that stem cells that are contained within that embryo eventually begin to grow and divide and form different parts of the body. So they form the head, they form the arms, they form the legs. And as the time goes on, when this woman goes from a, for a scan, she will start to see that her pregnancy is not just a little speck anymore, but she can see a head, she can see arms, and she can even see the genitalia of the baby in order to determine the gender or the sex of the baby rather. So stem cells that are able to do that are called totipotent stem cells. And when they're embryonic, we call them pluripotent. As we grow older, some of our stem cells will lose their potency and they would only be able to divide and form specific types of cells. In this case, we call them multipotent cells. And examples of these are cells that are found in the bone marrow, which are able to replicate as many times as possible, but are only able to produce blood cells. There are many possibilities with stem cells. A stem cell can become one of the 220 different cells in the body. As you can see in this image here, which I got from advancedcells.com, uh, you can form the kidney, the genitalia, liver, the heart, lungs, the brain, it depends. But most of these are still in experimental stages, like I said earlier. Stem cells can also be used to reverse a number of conditions. And in some cases, bone marrow transplant, which contains, the bone marrow contains a lot of stem cells, have been used to reverse conditions like sickle cell anemia. But the treatment is very expensive and it also comes at a very high physical cost for the patient. That brings us to the last phase of this, which is cancer. Cancers are basically uncontrolled mitosis, which means that the cells continue to divide until they form a tumor, which is an irregular mass of cells. Cancer begins when there's a mutation in the genes that control cell division, which means that those genes are unable to switch off the cells and stop them from dividing. These mutated cells are often called oncogenes, and any agent that causes cancer is a carcinogen. Now, you've probably heard of different carcinogens in the environment. So, for example, there are foods that are said to be carcinogens. Um, standing in the sun and having exposure to UV light can be a carcinogen in itself. It is also important to know that just because a person has a tumor doesn't mean that they have cancer. Some tumors are benign, which means that they don't spread from their site of origin and they don't cause any damage whatsoever to the body. Some tumors, on the other hand, are malignant, which means they spread across the body, they attack other tissue and destroy them, they can block the lungs, the intestines, or the blood vessels. They can also break off and spread throughout the body to other parts in order to form secondary growths. And this is what we call metastasis. Metastasis is simply the method through which cancer cells spread themselves across the body. So I think this brings us to the end of mitosis in general. Um, this was a very good revision for you i hope if there are any questions you would like to ask please post them in the comment section um in the next chapter which is chapter six we will be looking at dna replication and protein synthesis i'll try to do that in two separate videos don't forget to check out the other videos that i have done on other topics of the cambridge as biology syllabus and if you have any questions for me please post them in the comment section until next time have a good time